Carterboro, composer of The Tragedy of Macbeth. Uh, you're a longtime collaborator of the Cohen brothers. Uh, so what was your reaction when Joel Cohen came to you with um, adapting Macbeth? <laughs> well, it's, you know, I, as you say, I've worked with them a long time. So every project is always fun and I'm always happy to hear that there's another one coming. Um, this one, of course, is different in a variety of ways. One, it's Shakespeare. Two, Ethan wasn't working on it. And, um, and three, it was happening in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> but, um, but it, you know, as I say, always exciting. And um, yeah, I, you know, it's, I'm, I, I, I live for doing these films. Mm -hmm. So what were your early discussions with Joel? Like, did, did he have like a vision for the sound of the film? No, which was which is nice. And sometimes they have specific ideas of what kind of music they want. The perfect examples being like their folk music films, like Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? You know, they know exactly what they want. For me, it's always the most fun when they don't. And in this case, Joel didn't have any specific suggestions. We talked before he shot about how, you know, the play, the story, you know, it fits certain traditional Hollywood genres, like it fits the genre of the thriller, like a couple plot a murder, and then, you know, you watch the, uh, how the weight of that act, you know, um, you know, destroys their relationship and their world. And so it's like, you know, Postman Always Rings Twice or Double Indemnity, you know, the, which are films that, you know, are right up our alley, but also a little bit of a horror film that's got witches and the supernatural. And also certainly, um, you know, a psychological um, drama at, at, at the very least. So we talked about how, yeah, there's certain genres of film that it does fit into. He didn't really, I mean, I knew they were shooting in black and white. There's no way with words to describe the, you know, what that's going to look like because the way that he shot it with um, Bruno is just extraordinary. It doesn't look like any other film we've seen in a long time, if ever. Um, so I didn't, I didn't fully grasp how that was going to um, really create a, its own aesthetic world, uh, but that is hard to put into words. Um, he did send me some shots while they were shooting, uh, just stills from the set. And then they were, the shoot was shut down by the pandemic. So um, I had about two thirds of the film to live with for months when we had no idea when they would ever finish it. Um, so it was, you know, I had a lot of time to think about it, but no, Joel didn't know exactly what he wanted, but I, but the good news is I had a really a lot of time to try out everything. Mm -hmm. The the score is uh, kind of spooky because it's it's kind of low and like a very bass. Uh, so what was your approach and uh, how, how did you get started on it? It is, yeah, out of, you know, we might've had like 30 musicians performing and three or four of them are bass, are bass players <laughs> is very, um, Basie. And that, you know, obviously it's a dark story. Anyone would describe it that way. But um, that was partly also the result of my discussion with Joel. Again, this even before he shot was, you know, okay, so this is Shakespeare. It, the dialogue is very dense, can be a little challenging for a contemporary audience to understand. Um, and what are we going to do? Is music going to play under these, these great monologues? And, um, and if so, uh, how do we make it not distracting? Um, and, you know, he did want the music to play under uh, a lot of these monologues. So often in a Coen Brothers film, we often stay away from playing music under dialogue. It's the dialogue and there's the music in there. Um, so it's a range that they're separate. But we settle on this idea that the dialogue is often really the melody and that the score is the accompaniment to that. And that's... Um, so by viewing it that way and having the music in a whole set of octaves that are not, you know, where it doesn't interfere with the, the human voice, um, that helped just as a, as a concept um, that helped us with that, that problem of, you know, there's so much dialogue and, how to, and it's hard to understand. Um, that's one reason for that. The other is, as, you, as I said, it is a dark story. And then also I'll say when I first saw the footage, you know, the beauty of the black and white combined with this sort of psychological horror story reminded me so much of Psycho that I couldn't not think of Bernard Herrmann's um, string score. And so I just, when I see, I saw the picture, I thought strings would just go so well with this, which they do. 
Um, so that was another reason. And then finally, the, you know, because of the specialness of this year, it's also, I couldn't help but think, oh, and string players can wear masks, you know, and that would help with the whole problem of how to record it. Yeah, that was quick thinking. <laughs> they, can, yeah. they could keep their masks on in the studio. Exactly. Uh, so how, how do you go about like identifying which uh, scenes would have the underscore under the dialogue and which like, you know, like monologue heavy scenes would not? Well, you know, we, um, because the film existed, like two thirds of the film existed before, you know, and then it was sat like that for many months. Um, we didn't really have a spotting session, which is where usually the composer and the director go through and they do say, here, there's gonna be music here, there isn't gonna be music there. Uh, so I actually ended up like trying music against pretty much all of the film um, because we had all this time on our hands and, um, and came to feel, okay, so these areas, sometimes, a scene might just need a base under it, something to propel it forward, um, and some needed more. Um, I have to say, because of yeah, the the generous amount of time that um, that this unfortunate uh, disaster gave us, we I was able to try out a lot of different approaches, but I did almost try every conceivable place. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, were there any scenes where you decided to scrap it, like you know, that this one doesn't doesn't need any music? Yes, um, I guess the one that was the one that I still kind of like, I I liked what was there, and it would it just would have been a different movie. Is um, the first time that we see Lady Macbeth, she's gotten a letter from Macbeth describing what the witches have fore foreseen for them, and she uh, lies down in bed and. Um, and, and has this very disturbing monologue where uh, she calls upon dark forces to, you know, to um, basically eliminate any warm feeling, any, any softness in her, in her heart and, uh, and give her the strength uh, to do what has to be done. Uh, and then her husband wakes her and we see the two of them together. And one of the things, there are many things that are striking about this version of Macbeth, but one that I really liked is how that relationship is, at least at first, really a very solid relationship. Like they, you can see that they love each other, they're tender with each other, they support each other. Um, Joel and Fran from the beginning called it the, the best marriage in Shakespeare, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and I, want, I really want to play that. Uh, that's just a, it, basically because it's the last thing you expect in Macbeth is to play, uh, have a love theme, you know, the love theme from Macbeth. The tragedy of Macbeth, but um, so I did write something there, and which I really liked. In the end, I think Joel just felt it was—it's a different movie. That's it was just distracting. I think to be to think, well, are we playing this? You know, is it really about this relationship? Did it, did it, did it sound I, like a romantic comedy or something? How different well, did, did it sound? <laughs> no, it wasn't a kind. I don't do romantic <laughs> comedy. Thank you, very much. but. Um, uh, but I do, do do romantic dark darkness, and um, yeah, it was it was it was a little it had a, a little bar talk to it because of its like um, constantly sh shifting tonality that never settles. Um, I'm describing you this piece of music that I really like, but you can barely it's a little bit in the film in a couple of places. But yeah, I really liked it because it was it was totally unsettled, but it had a little bit Tristan and his old kind of like mysterious romance that, you know, but it's also disturbing. Um, and uh, anyway, I loved it, but it didn't make it to the uh, final cut. <laughs> you need to just uh, drop that as a bonus track. So, so we can well, all- You know, we it. didn't record it is the problem. I know you're exactly, it's one of those things you think, oh, you know, if I had an extra half hour, I should have put it on the page, recorded it with the orchestra. Cause you're right, I would, I would love to have it, but, um, but that happens on every film. There's something you wish you would record it, even if it didn't make it into the film, but we're always like rushing to get everything on the page. And yeah, I didn't have time to do well, that. Well, one day you'll, you'll record it and then we'll get the exactly. year. Exactly, the love thing <laughs> in the tragedy of Macbeth, that's right. Uh, well, Carter, it was great speaking with you. Uh, thanks for your time and we'll see you back here in a little bit. Okay. Thank you.